historical objects of high heritage value and contemporary works of art. It provides a home for unique Pan-African art collections, including the historic Psalm 32 art collection, the Mapungubwe national treasures, including the iconic Golden Rhino, and the Anglo Gold Ashanti Barbia Muller gold collections. More than this, the Javit UP provides a space for appreciating the collective human cultural heritage experiences of Africa and a voice for expressing Pan African artistic practices, experiences, and values. By stimulating collaboration across disciplines, Javit UP ignites opportunities for inclusive conversations in both physical and virtual environments. Its high-quality, high-tech facilities and accessible digital infrastructure provide opportunities for imagining new ways of learning and teaching through the arts and for the sharing of cultural experiences with diverse publics across all ages and across all regions, offline and online. The Javit UP is a laboratory for new knowledge and new ideas in curatorial practices and for inclusive, transdisciplinary collaboration in Africa and the diaspora. Through our ties with the immediate communities of Tswane and beyond, we connect visitors, stakeholders and practitioners to instill an appreciation of the arts and to co-create innovations in art education, mediation and cultural entrepreneurship. The Javit Art Centre provides a place to reflect to learn, to share, to flourish, and to enjoy. The Javit Art Center at the University of Pretoria. Reimagining our futures. The Javit Art Center at the University of Pretoria is a new center for the arts and cultural heritage that is unique on the African continent. This state of the art center creates an interface between historical objects of high heritage value and contemporary works of art. It provides a home for unique Pan African art collections, including the historic Psalm 32 art collection, the Mapungubwe national treasures, including the iconic Golden Rhino and the Anglo Gold Ashanti Barbia Muller Gold Collections. More than this, the Javit UP provides a space for appreciating the collective human cultural heritage experiences of Africa and a voice for expressing Pan-African artistic practices, experiences and values. By stimulating collaboration across disciplines, Javit UP ignites opportunities for inclusive conversations in both physical and virtual environments. Its high-quality, high-tech facilities and accessible digital infrastructure provide opportunities for imagining new ways of learning and teaching through the arts and for the sharing of cultural experiences with diverse publics across all ages and across all regions, offline and online. The Javit UP is a laboratory for new knowledge and new ideas in curatorial practices and for inclusive, transdisciplinary collaboration in Africa and the diaspora. Through our ties with the immediate communities of Tswane and beyond, we connect visitors, stakeholders and practitioners to instill an appreciation of the arts and to co-create innovations in art education, mediation and cultural entrepreneurship. The Javit Art Centre provides a place to reflect to learn, to share, to flourish, and to enjoy. The Javit Art Center at the University of Pretoria. Reimagining our futures.
The Javed Art Center at the University of Pretoria is a new center for the arts and cultural heritage that is unique on the African continent. This state-of-the-art center creates an interface between historical objects of high heritage value and contemporary works of art. It provides a home for unique Pan-African art collections, including the historic South 32 art collection, the Mapungubwe national treasures, including the iconic Golden Rhino, and the Anglo Gold Ashanti Barbia Muller Gold Collections. More than this, the Javit UP provides a space for appreciating the collective human cultural heritage experiences of Africa and a voice for expressing Pan African artistic practices, experiences, and values. By stimulating collaboration across disciplines, Javit UP ignites opportunities for inclusive conversations in both physical and virtual environments. Its high quality, high tech facilities and accessible digital infrastructure provide opportunities for imagining new ways of learning and teaching through the arts and for the sharing of cultural experiences with diverse publics across all ages and across all regions, offline and online. The Javit UP is a laboratory for new knowledge and new ideas in curatorial practices and for inclusive, transdisciplinary collaboration in Africa and the diaspora. Through our ties with the immediate communities of Tswana and beyond, we connect visitors, stakeholders and practitioners to instill an appreciation of the arts and to co-create innovations in art education, mediation and cultural entrepreneurship. The Javit Art Centre provides a place to reflect to learn, to share, to flourish, and to enjoy. The Javit Art Center at the University of Pretoria. Reimagining our futures. The Javit Art Centre at the University of Pretoria is a new centre for the arts and cultural heritage that is unique on the African continent. This state-of-the-art centre creates an interface between historical objects of high heritage value and contemporary works of art. It provides a home for unique Pan-African art collections, including the historic South 32 art collection, the Mapungubwe national treasures, including the iconic Golden Rhino, and the Anglo Gold Ashanti Barbia Muller Gold Collections. More than this, the Javit UP provides a space for appreciating the collective human cultural heritage experiences of Africa and a voice for expressing Pan African artistic practices, experiences, and values. By stimulating collaboration across disciplines, Javit UP ignites opportunities for inclusive conversations in both physical and virtual environments. Its high quality, high tech facilities and accessible digital infrastructure provide opportunities for imagining new ways of learning and teaching through the arts and for the sharing of cultural experiences with diverse publics across all ages and across all regions, offline and online. The Javit UP is a laboratory for new knowledge and new ideas in curatorial practices and for inclusive, transdisciplinary collaboration in Africa and the diaspora. Through our ties with the immediate communities of Tswana and beyond, we connect visitors, stakeholders and practitioners to instill an appreciation of the arts and to co-create innovations in art education, mediation and cultural entrepreneurship. The Javit Art Centre provides a place to reflect to learn, to share, to flourish, and to enjoy. The Javit Art Center at the University of Pretoria. Reimagining our futures.
We live in a country in transition within the post-apartheid context that is experiencing deep societal challenges. Where the roles of the arts and cultural heritage are not fully valued, nor are integrated into the primary developmental agendas of the country. We believe that an opportunity is being missed here, and the creative sector has a clear role to play in the meaningful development and transformation of our country and continent. Creating a shared national and continental identities begins to restore dignities and values of our people, liberating their talents and creativity. Our creative spirit is not limited to the arts and humanities. We are a source of innovative thought in science and technology. Used to its fullest, our arts and cultural heritage can serve as a powerful catalyst towards a truly liberated and integrated country and continent. Our purpose as a response in this regard speaks to us being a space of learning through transdisciplinary journeys in the creative sector, meaning we do not limit our practice only within the traditional artistic framework. We are a laboratory of ideas and experimentation towards the development of new knowledges and connections through our dynamic and innovative curatorial strategies and practices. As we navigate these journeys, we prioritize on accessing and engaging wider publics, both locally and regionally, with a significant global reach. Through inquiries, we begin to have a better understanding of our dynamic and diverse human conditions, with the intentions of establishing innovative processes of integration of thoughts and practice for reimagining our collective futures. In fulfilling our purpose, our values are embedded in care, inclusivity, collaboration, innovation, social justice, and accountability for our commitments and actions. As we welcome you to be an active participant and stakeholder in this journey through our varied collections on long-term loan here at the Jabed Arts Centre at the University of Pretoria, we zoom in one of the most significant collections that embraces the values and intentions anchored in the South African National Day of Reconciliation, the Mapungube Gold Collection. This collection on exhibit at the Java DP constitute an important artistic, spiritual, cultural, and scientific pre-colonial heritage of our region. These objects of high heritage value are an entry point to acknowledging and elevating the critical histories of our region, to begin the process of bringing dignity back to the people of this continent, thus unlearn and learn anew much that has been misrepresented and erased from authentic human experiences of our collective African histories. The difficult contestations that we currently have deserve to be allowed a platform for conversations and mediation within our contemporary context. The way to a true emancipation and progressive development of a nation of this continent. The difficult contestations as we currently have deserve to be allowed a platform for conversation and mediation within our contemporary context. The way to a true emancipation and progressive development of nations of this continent will be through relearning our collective cultural heritage strengths towards discovering solutions to our challenges. Our work at the Java DP must position the arts as a meaningful voice and player in the development and transformation of our country and continent. In closing, inspired by the dynamic legacies of Mapungube, the year 2022 for the Java DP will mark the launch of a new ambitious and challenging vision plan that takes us out of our comfort zones in order to discover our purpose, enhancing the creation of a new exciting normality in our region and the rest of the continent. And again, we invite you to be part of this collective experience. And two, we wish you an enjoyable, uplifting end of year and a progressive new year ahead. Thank you. Hello, my name is Siko Siotula Zigumund. The title of my presentation today is The Minds of Great Zimbabwe Reimagined Lessons for Mapungubwe. The paper is taken from a larger study titled Visualizing Late Iron Age Settlements in the Digital Age. And in terms of this study, I would like to thank my supervisors, Professor Anya Schwartz, Lisa Creel, and Lars Eckstein.
The images I wish to look at today are images that challenge power. I wish to look at such images on the backdrop of images with power. What do these images flashing across the screen right now have in common? What these images have in common, at least in the interest of our purposes here today, is that they are what cultural theorist Nicholas Mertzoff describes as visuality. That is, that they are images designed to make power seem self-evident. In an attempt to visualize usable African history, remains of Southern African late Iron Age settlements have been animated through illustration across the late 19th, 20th and 21st century by researchers as well as in African nativist and nationalist rhetoric. Late Iron Age settlements here refer to settlements discovered in Southern Africa from the late 19th century onwards, located on the borders of modern day Botswana, Zimbabwe, South Africa and Mozambique, and stretching all the way into um, trading posts in Mozambique. And this northern part of Southern Africa has buried in its landscape the ruins of the earliest known settlements in the region. Stonewalled architecture has come to characterize such settlements. Stonewalled settlements like K2 and Mapungubwe, Kami, Bukoni, Maikeni, and Great Zimbabwe are believed to have belonged to complex societies involved in the cultivation of crops, working of ivory, mining of gold, and long-distance trade. This collection of settlements is attractive to efforts in post-colonial nation-building as a regional sequence building up to the modern states and capital cities of Southern Africa. In the change from an apartheid state to a democratic one, the visualization of Mapwengubwe in South Africa becomes important to nationalist rhetoric in search of a usable past and other alternatives to dominant Eurocentric and colonial history, as well as visual culture. Here, we have the order of Mapwengube, the highest order of, um, that can be given in Southern Africa, and it uses the golden rhino, which is behind me, found at Mapwengube. Mapungube is an Iron Age settlement and kingdom which flourished between the 11th and 13th century. Um, within the context of nationalist rhetoric, it is thought of as Southern Africa's first state. The pyramids and sphinxes of Egypt, the ruins of Great Zimbabwe, sand rock paintings, Benini bronzes, and African arts, or mass rather, have all similarly been used. Although I have been tasked to do so, I will not be talking about the visualization of Mapwengubwe today, not directly anyway. I find Mapwengubwe at this point in Southern African history and for our purposes here today, simultaneously far away, yet too close to describe in any kind of subtlety and sensitivity. To try and tackle the enigma that is the visualization of Mapwengubwe, I will be looking at a settlement like it, but one which I can, I will argue, be seen with far more clarity. Today, I will focus my attention on our close neighbors, Zimbabwe, and the visualization of Great Zimbabwe, an Iron Age settlement succeeding Mapwengubwe, thus part of the same culture. Zimbabwe is interesting because right up to the 1970s, South Africa and Zimbabwe shared great similarities, particularly with how the deep past of these two countries had been portrayed um, in accepted, questioned, and questionable historical accounts. After Zimbabwe gained independence, however, such similarities took a drastic turn. The independent nation state of Zimbabwe in the 1980s dived into a nationalist state building project of which archaeology and the school syllabus played a key part. Detailing the school curriculum policy in Zimbabwe between 1980 and 2010, academic Nathan Moyo insists, the dissemination of nationalist historiography was work that had to be done as a reaction to Eurocentric perceptions that Africans had no history prior to the arrival of Europeans on the continent. Similarly, 
In 2012, Professor in Archaeology, Innocent Pickerai, insisted, and he can let us know later on if he still holds this view, that devising a conscious and passionate transformation agenda in archaeology is something South Africa is embarrassingly failing to embrace, nearly two decades after the 1994 elections that brought an end to apartheid. On the contrary, this is something that the post-independent um, state of Zimbabwe recognized and excelled at shaping. Zimbabwe indeed managed to reimagine its long past by diving into a conscious and passionate transformation agenda in archaeology, just as archaeology was used in a legitimating strategy in the colonization of the Zimbabwe Plateau, it also played an important role in the transformation that followed independence. I plan today on linking that phase in transformation in Zimbabwean politics with what is currently being called for in South Africa and what the Javid UP, from what I gather, is trying to achieve with the part of the Mapungubo collection it shows to the public going forward. Archaeology is an important discipline when discussing the Southern African distant past. The Southern African distant past can be broken up into three moments, the Khoisan complex, the Mapungubwe and Zimbabwe estate, and the Nguni estate or Shagian period, which saw the rise of the Zulu kingdom. The last period is well documented and historians know quite a lot about this. Little is however known about the first two, because they are primarily studied through material remains, this very long or distant Southern African past is the concern of archaeology. I turn to archaeology today not as an archaeologist myself, but as a someone located within visual cultural study and as an artist. I turn to archaeology because this field of study is the major contributor to the imagining of the long Southern African past. My task today is therefore not to comment on archaeology as a discipline or a field of specialization, but rather to contribute to something that archaeology is a significant stakeholder in, namely the visualization of the long Southern African past. In an obituary of influential Zimbabwean archaeologist Peter Gaik, Pikarai states, Peter Garlic died on 2 December 2011. He leaves behind an academic legacy that successfully challenged Rhodesian colonial settler ideology and defined a post-colonial archaeological research program in Zimbabwe. When talking of successfully challenging Rhodesian colonial settler ideology, Pikarai refers to Garlic's life work in general. Possibly this book right here, which is arguably Garlic's most important work. In defining a post-colonial research program in Zimbabwe, however, he refers specifically to the publications Life at Great Zimbabwe and Great Zimbabwe Described and Explained. Thus, Pikarai underscores the importance of these two books in the dissemination of the idea of Great Zimbabwe to the post-independent Zimbabwean nation. I will today focus on life at Great Zimbabwe alone. Although written 10 years apart and under different political climates, it is beneficial to read Garlic's 1983 Life at Great Zimbabwe in relation to the earlier 1973 publication Great Zimbabwe New Aspects of Archaeology. The former can in many ways be seen as a streamlined version of the latter. One was written at the dawn of independence from white minority rule the other in the midst of the war for liberation. One was written for children and the general public, the other for an academic audience. Life at Great Zimbabwe aimed at furthering consciousness within a newly independent Zimbabwe, while the earlier book primarily aimed at contesting colonial and imperial claims of authority over the Zimbabwean landscape. The two publications differ most significantly in their attempt at resolving imperial visuality. While Great Zimbabwe New Aspects in Archaeology exposes the violence of imperial visuality, namely how, fueled by centuries of hearsay and visions of gold, Cecil John Rhodes and his newly amalgamated exploration company, the British South African Company, barged into and occupied the territory 
today referred to as Zimbabwe, using archaeology as a smokescreen, Life at Great Zimbabwe offers alternatives to this violence. These two books are two different books for two different moments. Published 10 years after its detailed academic counterpart and just two years after the independence of Zimbabwe, Life at Great Zimbabwe is entangled with the hopes of the new nation it worked to shape. The book is a thin book, um, with an audience ranging from children to the general public. The book is written in accessible language and it uses storytelling and a generous number of illustrations as a teaching strategy. As suggested by the title, Life at Great Zimbabwe explores life. It moves past the compulsive question of who built Great Zimbabwe that dominated the archaeological endeavors of the preceding generation by taking for granted that Great Zimbabwe was the unaided work of indigenous black Africans. Life at Great Zimbabwe, as does Great Zimbabwe New Aspects in Archaeology, describes mining, gold mining in particular, as a significant anchor to modernity in southern Africa. Under the heading gold mining in the book, figures A and B which I show on the screen today, illustrate the process of alluvial and reef mining that took place at Great Zimbabwe. The images reimagine life in general and gold mining in particular as an aspect of life at Great Zimbabwe in the 13th century. Through projections from archaeological evidence about how gold could have been mined in the 13th century at Great Zimbabwe, the process of alluvial mining and reef mining are illustrated alongside text. The images may seem simple and childish even, but they represent a huge shift in the visualization of the deep Southern African past, so much so that I will dare to call them counter-visual. That is, they are images designed to counter and challenge the images preceding them, um, images, um, imperial images. Here, in figure B, a small community works alongside a riverbed. Some people pan for gold in the water close by. Others, working behind them, dig pits in the ground with hose, while others still walk towards the riverbed balancing vessels on their head. A person sits on the floor with their legs stretched under a tree, anchoring the image off center. The person sits overlooking two pots, one on an open fire. They are pictured breastfeeding a small baby and another child stands in the vicinity close by watching and playing and with an unidentified object. Similarly, figure B illustrates a small group of people mining rock. A person is pictured inside a gold shaft hammering while another lowers a vessel. A large boulder hangs above the figure, reminding the viewer of the dangers associated with mining and the prominence of rocks in, Zimbabwean, in the Zimbabwean landscape. In the far distance, the process of weakening rocks with fire before they are split with iron wedges is illustrated. A large stone sits on an open fire, two figures tend to the fire, one with hands on the hips and the other carrying firewood on their head. The figures are drawn side by side using um, the same mark so that one would not seem to be managing the other. In the foreground, closer to the figure inside the mining shaft, more figures are at work. Men and women stand bent over and are seated side by side, all holding a tool and hard at work mining for gold. The small scale mining illustrated in figures A and B is executed with a community where old and young, perhaps relatives, children, lovers, partners, and parents work within the same vicinity. What is pictured in these images is perhaps the utopia of Talagubai, longed for in Hugh Masigela's very well-known um, jazz hit protesting against the harsh apartheid mining conditions, Stimela. Um, I put uh, a transcript of Stimela with the Zulu translation, which I've provided for you. Um, and I just want to read bits of it. And it says, there is a train, I'm sure we all know the lyrics to this song. There is a train that comes from Namibia and Malawi. There is a train that comes from Zambia and Zimbabwe. There is a train that comes from Angola and Mozambique. From all these hinterlands of Southern and Central Africa, this train carries young and old African men who are conscripted to come and work on contract 
in the gold mineral mines of Johannesburg. Some of the Zulu uh, translation reads, steam train is fueled by coal, leaves me at a place of kneeling. They say we will become coal, we will become coal. Oh my, we eat the shit of the company, we live like dogs, we go inside, inside holes, mother. They say steam train. We cry for our relatives, let's go back to Dalagubai. We cry for our children, oh my, let's go back to Dalagubai. We cry for our lovers, oh mother, oh, let's go back to Dalagubai. We cry for those who birthed us, oh my, oh my, oh my. Dalagubai here is interpreted literally as an Africanized Delago Bay from the Portuguese Bea um, de Lagao, known today as um, the Bay of Maputo. It has also been translated more figuratively as dusk or morning or utopia. As poetically described by Masigela in Stimela, part of what apartheid did on the, on the African continent was separate the idea of work and home for black bodies by decoupling industry from residents. To be part of industry, black people, black men in particular, had to leave the homelands to go to the city to work. In the program of apartheid, the city representing modernity and the future was to remain white and the hinterlands, native reserves that labor would return to. Figure A and B picture an ambivalent space that is both hinterland, where black bodies are said to exist, and the place of industry that is said to be a marker of the future. The breakdown of communities and family structures for the purposes of work, profit, and industry was targeted at black bodies and communities on the African continent. In post-apartheid South Africa and in the world at large, the idea of work, how people work, where people work in relation to where they live and how work affects family, health, um, are subjects that concern a lot more people. Thus, the image is not only a depiction of the past for black bodies in the 13th century, but a vision of what a future could look like for all. With the coronavirus pandemic raging on, while people lose their jobs, and others create home offices, the structure of modern work has more than ever become a subject of serious discussion. Amongst many other aspects of life, the pandemic has asked modern work to reevaluate very basic assumptions like where work should take place and the role of family in relation to work. The images are in contrast with well-known images like this that depict what Anki Kro calls the Bas van die Plaas mentality. And this image hangs right here at the Javid UP, um, the, song of the, kick, the Song of the Pick by um, Gerald Sicotto. In figures A and B, black bodies are humanized and depicted not as labor units, but primarily as people. The bodies in figures A and B are captured both at work but also busy with the business of life. They perform the daily activities of life with ease at home, away from the demanding eyes of an overseer, making food and raising children, working for their community and with their community. Men and women, old and young, are not separated by work but in fact joined by it colloquially referred to as Mahayeng or Amakaya for places of work in Sutu and Kosa, respectively, the homelands of black people were designed in apartheid policies to socially engineer labor, ensuring the economic and political dominance of white South Africa. Homelands are characteristically overcrowded and deserted, ecologically challenged and unbalanced, and as a result of middle-aged leaving in numbers in search of better lives in the city, um, they're often empty. Here the old, mostly women, look after young children while those of working age move to the city to find occupation. Post-apartheid, these spaces have become ambivalent spaces, simultaneously zones of exclusion that embody the opposite of the hopes of modernity that cities represent, and spaces in which um, pride for ethnic identity is maintained and manifested.
by reconciling black African bodies and their homelands with industry and the cities, figure A and B present what seems a paradox to the logic of imperial visuality. Imperial visuality works to visualize a movement from the primitive to modernity. According to this logic, Masigela's Stimela moves from the hinterlands of Southern Africa to the city of Johannesburg. Here, the city is the symbol of modernity with the assumption that the hinterland of Dalagubai is its opposite. Figure A and B firstly do well in picturing black Africans in the image, unlike this image where we see basically no presence of figures at all, or if they are there, they're very sparse. Um, it pictures black Africans in relation to the Zimbabwean ruins, not as anonymous bodies to be hunted and found, like in this map and the search for great Zimbabwe that took place before its finding. Um, it does not picture black Africans as servants, as does this image, as workers at archeological digs or native informants at expeditions in quests for lost cities. Black bodies work without the visible presence of an overseer, as in this image. Unlike in abusive labor practices inflicted on black bodies in Southern Africa during apartheid, there is no apparent master of the farm that flexes his authority on his laborers. Finally, the text accompanying figures A and B is narrated in a fun and palatable manner, maintaining distance from the academic work that informs it. I put an insert here from the book and it reads, when people think of Great Zimbabwe, they also think of the gold that was found there. Foreign traders um, were envious of the gold riches that they imagined. They never found them because Great Zimbabwe relied much more on cattle. And so this is just a fun and accessible way of speaking and it's the tone that is taken on by the whole book. On the surface and out of context, Figure A and B are very simple drawings. Considered within the context that accompany them, they could be looked at as pure illustration projecting archeological findings for children. Figures A and B, however, do so much more than this. What lessons then can be learned from the shift in visuality presented by these two images? Critiquing the reformation of Great Zimbabwe historiography from a post-colonial Zimbabwe, academic Nathan Moyo, who I referred to earlier, observes that the backlash of a syllabus deployed to serve the socialist native state in the 1980s was a nationalist historiography primarily concerned with demonstrating that Africa had produced and organized polities and, and monarchies and cities just like Europe had. Moyo observes that such historiography eulogized Africa's past without subjecting it um, to critique. In Zimbabwe, nationalist historiography took the form of tracing the roots of African nationalism and its connections with the uprising of the first and second Chimurenga of 1896 um, to 1897 and um, the second Chimurenga um, of 1960 to 1970. This is a clear warning of what could happen. Um, for instance, um, instead of focusing on making the findings of Mapungubwe accessible to the public, um, powerful institutions, like the Javid perhaps, are concerned solely with linking that history just to the struggle for liberation or other contemporary issues, or idealizing this past with no critique so that this past becomes a time and place akin to heaven on earth. In their representation of the 13th century Great Zimbabwe, figures A and figures B are partly guilty of praising a utopian African past, tranquil and relaxed without any of the problems of modernity. Nevertheless, the strength of these two illustrations and what is of interest here today is not in what um, they propose as the past, but rather how this imagination of the past simultaneously holds value for the past, present, and future. The shift represented by these images is significant. Modern day South Africa has been estimated as the country with the biggest income inequality in the world, with the Southern African state of Namibia, Botswana, and Zimbabwe following closely behind. Neighboring Zimbabwe, situated 
um, sustained an economic and social political catastrophe as a direct result of the crude ways in which it attended to address land reform post-colonialism. South Africa, like many other Southern African states, has not managed to address the disposition of land leading up to as well as during the apartheid era um, in a suitable manner. The mining industry of the late 19th century, which visualized land as an economic resource, vividly captured and put into motion the two biggest problems facing post-apartheid South Africa in the 20th century, namely economic inequality and the unsatisfactory land reform. Economic inequality and unsatisfactory land reform have been responsible for a number of flashpoints post-apartheid. The Marikana massacre of 2012 is a clear example of the dramatic turn that such flashpoints can produce. I cannot help but see the images connected with the massacre and its aftermath in continuum with figures A and B imagined in Life at Great Zimbabwe. Such images are a continuum of protest and revolt. They counter visuality. Here in the image that we're looking at, um, families of the miners killed at Marigana gather on a hill overlooking the place where the massacre took place eight years earlier, um, seeking justice from power. Over here, eight years earlier, miners gather on open land in their numbers, singing and chanting in protest. A postcard reads, 12,500 rand or pack your bags and leave the country, viva gold reminding us exactly what the protests were about. The miners of Marikana, just outside of Johannesburg, were protesting against the power of its owners, the stakeholders of Lonman, with its headquarters in London. Miners protested their insufficient wages and excessive difference between the compensation of mine managers and miners. Their demands were to be paid a monthly wage of 12,500 rand. Again, what we see here is an image of 2012 and not the late 19th century, neither is it the 20th century, yet the relevance of the utopia dreamed of in the images in life at Great Zimbabwe, dreamed of by Masigela, perhaps in his steam train, is clear. Unjust mining practices, particularly the unfair remuneration for workers, remains relevant. Marakana, as we all know, ended in death. By reimagining gold mining as an aspect of life in Great Zimbabwe in the 13th century, the images in life at Great Zimbabwe primarily speculate about the reality of 13th century through projections. The images rebuke the imperial visuality of late 19th century and early 20th century. They also importantly offer the promise of real existence beyond existence as just labor. In the case of Marikana, this existence had a price tag. Some of life at Great Zimbabwe's concluding thoughts are, above all, gilded by our knowledge, we must again people the deserted ruins, reconstruct the houses, and fill the city with the industry, color, and life that once it had. For by recreating the people and society they made, in our imagination, we will start to understand the past. Figures A and B in life at Great Zimbabwe reimagine life in general and specifically gold mining as an aspect of life at Great Zimbabwe in the 13th century. The images in the book are tasked, complicatedly so, with rebuking the imperial visuality of the late 19th century as well as speculating about the reality of the 13th century through projections. They fulfill both these tasks. More than this, as I have shown, the images serve as imagination of an alternative to the realities of colonialism and apartheid. They are thus not images about the past, but images that grapple with the present and the future too a space that would contrast the violent reality of imperial, colonial, apartheid, and post-apartheid mining. As the Javid UP grapples with how to make the deep Southern African past more accessible to various publics, 
it can look to moments of transition in history, like the Zimbabwean moment that produced publications such as this, publications which produced what I would like to see as seemingly painful but radical images like figures A and figures B. Thank you. The Javid Art Centre at the University of Pretoria is a new centre for the arts and cultural heritage that is unique on the African continent. This state of the art centre creates an interface between historical objects of high heritage value and contemporary works of art. It provides a home for unique Pan-African art collections, including the historic South 32 art collection, the Mapungubwe National Treasures, including the iconic Golden Rhino, and the Anglo Gold Ashanti Barbia Muller Gold Collections. More than this, the Javid UP provides a space for appreciating the collective human cultural heritage experiences of Africa and a voice for expressing Pan African artistic practices, experiences, and values. By stimulating collaboration across disciplines, Javid UP ignites opportunities for inclusive conversations in both physical and virtual environments. Its high-quality, high-tech facilities and accessible digital infrastructure provide opportunities for imagining new ways of learning and teaching through the arts and for the sharing of cultural experiences with diverse publics across all ages and across all regions, offline and online. The Javit UP is a laboratory for new knowledge and new ideas in curatorial practices and for inclusive, transdisciplinary collaboration in Africa and the diaspora. Through our ties with the immediate communities of Tswana and beyond, we connect visitors, stakeholders and practitioners to instill an appreciation of the arts and to co-create innovations in art education, mediation and cultural entrepreneurship. The Javit Art Centre provides a place to reflect to learn, to share, to flourish, and to enjoy. The Javid Art Center at the University of Pretoria. Reimagining our futures. The Javid Art Center at the University of Pretoria is a new center for the arts and cultural heritage that is unique on the African continent. This state of the art center creates an interface between historical objects of high heritage value and contemporary works of art. It provides a home for unique Pan-African art collections, including the historic South 32 art collection, the Mapungubwe national treasures, including the iconic Golden Rhino, and the Anglo Gold Ashanti Barbia Muller Gold Collections. More than this, the Javid UP provides a space for appreciating the collective human cultural heritage experiences of Africa and a voice for expressing Pan African artistic practices, experiences, and values. By stimulating collaboration across disciplines, Javid UP ignites opportunities for inclusive conversations in both physical and virtual environments. Its high-quality, high-tech facilities and accessible digital infrastructure provide opportunities for imagining new ways of learning and teaching through the arts and for the sharing of cultural experiences with diverse publics across all ages and across all regions, offline and online. The Javit UP is a laboratory for new knowledge and new ideas in curatorial practices and for inclusive, transdisciplinary collaboration in Africa. Oh.
Welcome everyone. Um, thank you to um, Aza for evocatively and musically uh, welcoming us and, and the spirit of Mapungugwe. Thank you so much. Um, I am uh, Shoni Pamukwena. I am a, uh, an associate professor at the Vet Institute for Social and Economic Research. And my job this morning is to facilitate a conversation um, which uh, very beautifully for us is happening around the, the artifacts, um, the material, the products, the gold of Mapungubwe. Um, 
Uh, earlier this morning, we had a uh, uh, presentation by Siko Siotula Sigamund. And so what I will do, I will introduce the rest of the panel. And then I will ask each member of the panel um, to talk a little bit about, I guess, what the material of Mafungube means to them, the site, um, how they came into a personal contact with it, or whether they have any personal reflections on the, on the, on the collection. And I will say that for myself, I actually had the pleasure of coming here um, when the um, room is empty, and it actually is quite a, um, a magnificent experience to walk through the Ashanti um, collection and then come to this collection, because they, they sort of speak to each other, uh, two different parts of the continent, um, but you suddenly have a sense of, of two histories being joined together. So that was my, my sort of personal um, and immediate response. But let me introduce our speaker. Um, Siko Siotula Silmund is a lecturer um, in the Department of Visual Arts at the University of Pretoria. Um, um, on to her uh, one side is uh, Professor uh, Dr. Matole Mutecha, who is the director of the Kara uh, Heritage Institute. And to my side um, is Professor uh, Innocent Picarai, who is the who is a professor of archaeology and also the head of department of the anthropology and archaeology uh, department here at BIT. And as I said, I will we'll go. I think we'll go in a from my perspective in an anti-clockwise um, um, rotation in our discussion. Um, so, Sika, I would like you to to um, open by telling us your own connection, as it were, to Mapungubwe and how you you came to identify the site or identify with with the site. Right. Um, I hear that a lot of people now uh, learn about Mapungubwe in their school syllabus, but when I was uh, at school, this definitely was not part of my school syllabus. I first bumped into Mapungubwe when I came to the University of Pretoria, um, because this collection actually used to sit on the old arts, in, in the old arts building. Um, it's something that I bumped into on campus while wondering about, and it's just when you see it, it has an impact on you and it calls you back. And so I think the gods at the uh, visual arts knew me because I was always there. Whenever I had a moment, I would sit with these objects and look and read. And so when I had a chance to really dive into a material that I wanted to study with my PhD, I knew that I wanted to study um, the distant Southern African past. I've worked in um, the contemporary art space and I think the contemporary art space does very well in challenging the colonial moment. But I think um, part of what post-colonial studies should do is to also look at distant pasts. And um, I think that a lot more artists should participate in this space. And this is why I decided to, um, to do that myself, to focus on the deep Southern African past. And um, you asked what these objects mean to me, or what Mapungube as a space means to me. I think. In my work, I always try to capitalize Southern Africa to mark it not as a regional direction, but really as a space that holds together. And when I talk about these settlements, I like to look at them as a region. So not just Mapwengubwe, but look at Mapwengubwe, K2, Great Zimbabwe, Maikeni, but also settlements that come much later like Bukoni and really look at them as a space that holds together and that has um, continuity into our modern states. And so this is what Mapwengubwe means to me. It's that um, initial moment, but that produces a whole um, landscape that holds together. Thanks for that. And uh, Dr. Motsefa? Now, my interest is that uh, I come from the ruling group of uh, Mujaji the Rain Queen, who <coughs> trace the lineage uh, to the Monomotapa Empire. And uh, <coughs> as a result, uh, 
I got interested as well in the origins of that empire and found that uh, it goes back to the Nuba Mountains and Nuba means gold and the Nuba Mountains are in uh, Napta in the Sudan which is the heartland of ancient Ethiopia and this uh, Nuba Mountain uh, the Nuba Mountain is a shrine of Ptah and then uh, that Ptah is the root of the word Mwanamutapa or Munomutapa and these are the people who migrated south, settled at Mbire in, on, in Tanganyika, now Tanzania, and DRC, and then came down to establish the <coughs> empire of uh, the people of the sun, and uh, established Mapungubia as the first royal court, and then when it declined, they went to create uh, Zimbabwe. And now uh, I found that uh, the universities and the archaeologists deal with the material culture of uh, Mapungui and Great Zimbabwe, not the spiritual culture. And then I'm interested in the spiritual culture because uh, our people who are Rosi and they are also known as uh, Vanembire, the Mbires were the spiritual leaders of the Mapungui and Great Zimbabwe Empire. So I thought that uh, one could make a contribution to complement what archaeologists are doing because they look at the objects, but we look at the spiritual meaning of the objects. Okay, Professor Pigura. Thank you very much, facilitator. Um, Innocent Pigura is my name. I'm an archaeologist by training. In fact, um, what Siko was talking about in terms of Peter Gallic. Peter Gallic was my first archaeology teacher in um, 1982 when I was studying my honors degree at the University of Zimbabwe. Um, I'm currently the deputy dean responsible for postgraduate studies in the Faculty of Humanities. So I've, I've partially left the, you know, the Department of Anthropology and Archaeology which remains my home department because that's where archaeology is being offered. Now, when it comes to Mapungubwe, um, I've interacted with Mapungubwe in several ways and layers. Um, first is an archaeologist studying ancient complex societies. Um, I focus on the Zimbabwe tradition or the Zimbabwe culture which embraces Mapungubwe, Great Zimbabwe, and beyond, including the Mtapa state. And I have written on Mapungubwe um, a number of articles. I have researched within the cultural landscape, the Limpopo Shashe um, valleys, where I've uh, recorded Mapungubwe type settlements. I've also interacted with the, the, the material culture in a number of ways. If you are studying ancient complex societies, one needs to know why and how these particular societies reach the level of technological sophistication that we see today and which we may not even be able to embrace. Um, and also ask questions, what can we do to be able to match some of those complex situations that we seem not able to in, in contemporary presence. So to me then it translates archaeology not into a study of the past, but also a study of the present. Thank you. Okay. If I could uh, get back to you, uh, Professor Pickerai, because I think may, many people don't actually really know what archaeology is about, its connection to African history, especially in this context of why was it that Peter, Peter Garlic's book became such a, um, a, a, a sort of a paradigm shifting book. Um, so can you explain a little bit what is it, what is archaeology's interest really yeah. in, in Africa and why is it that, that we use archaeology in order to, to study these ancient complex societies? Yes. Now, cognizant of the fact that we've got an audience, uh, perhaps 99% uh, of whom may not be archaeologists, I, I'm not going to adopt a scholarly definition of what archaeology is. 
uh, but what archaeology should be. But in my view, archaeology is really deep history. It's, it's, it's a means to, un to understand the long-term history. But for me, archaeology is also about the most recent and the recent. In other words, what continues from deep history into the present. How the past unfolds into the present. In other ways, how it continues, how it changes and, and, and leads into what we see today. Two minutes ago, we are already into the archaeological past. How do we understand that material culture? But back then, two million years ago, how do we understand that kind of material culture as well? It becomes more and more difficult. For many, because archaeology is a discipline that you know, came from Europe, when I say I'm an archaeologist, the response that I get from the public is, or, or, from, or from whoever is talking to me, is that it's very interesting. End of story. Mm -hmm. It simply means they don't understand what they're doing. So it is incumbent upon us as archaeologists to explain ourselves to the public what the role of archaeology is, what it should achieve, and, and um, how relevant it is to the present. So um, while archaeology is about deep time or understanding deep time, what happened then, for example, understanding the context in which uh, the humans evolved, we're talking about um, and the craft of humankind and similar sites, how complex societies such as Mapunguge came to be, right? That was societies then, but what does it mean to understand those societies today? Can we derive anything that these societies, these people, these contexts are telling us in terms of the present? So that's my approach to archaeology, and that's what it should be. And I'm sure you have to work a lot against the, uh, the popular culture image of archaeologists as tomb raiders, because that's how I think most people come into contact with, with archaeology, by seeing uh, films in which archaeologists are essentially just stealing, stealing treasure from, from, from graves. Yeah, quite right. But films aside, if, if you listen to Seiko's presentation um, in terms of the gold that was um, pillaged from, from not only Great Zimbabwe, but from you know, Great Zimbabwe tradition sites, Zimbabwe culture sites, you know, including Mapungu. In fact, we are glad we've got some of these things remaining uh, because by then antiquarians you know, had left the stage. These things actually happened. And these are the ones that created the image of archaeology that we have today that um, it's about treasure hunting. Um, it's about um, um, these um, films where you see escapades of people trying to rescue something uh, within a Maya temple or within an Egyptian context. They have shaped a view of archaeology that we have internalized, or at least the majority of us have internalized, but which is not supposed to be the case, which is not accurate. Um, archaeology is supposed to be a science of trying to understand the past. It's supposed to be something done in a systematic way to understand the past. But if you mix that with treasure hunting, then you create a narrative or a perception that takes it out from the context in which we are supposed to understand the past. For Mapungubwe, for Great Zimbabwe and other tradition sites, Zimbabwe tradition sites, part of what we are seeing represents the loot that um, happened in the 1890s, 1900s, to the point that um, it became so systematic that the then Rhodesian government set up by Cecil John Rhodes um, under the British South, African, uh, South Africa Company was able to export something around, that was in 1909, two and a half million pounds you know, of gold per year. And if you translate that in, in, in inflationary terms, we are talking about 300 million pounds in today's value. And that's the official route. Now, just imagine what was you know, um, exported out of the country in terms of uh, the antiquarians, the treasure hunters, and, and ordinary looters. It was a lot more. 
So beyond the films that you are talking about, this is actually a reality in Africa, in Southern Africa, at Great Zimbabwe, at Mapungubwe, which represented a lot of looting and uh, a lot of cultural losses. And what we see right now is only a remnant of the little that is left. And uh, Dr. Matsecha, you were talking about the spiritual dimensions of, of these sites and, and the ways in which they connect to other parts of the African continent, other empires on the African continent from the Exum Empire, the Nubian empires, and all the way down south, the Great Lakes, up to our own uh, riverine uh, 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 complex, the, the Limpopo and Zambezi rivers. Um, so how do you incorporate that into what, for example, Professor Pikurai is saying? So how do we bring a conversation between um, this, what one would call an eagle's, to use an, a, a, an image from Zimbabwe, an eagle's eye view? Of the of the continent, and then the the minute detail of of something like spiritual practices and spirituality. I think our challenge is that uh, our generation is two thousand years behind the people who created the Mapungubwe and create Zimbabwe civilization, because those people were <clears throat> deeply spiritual and they saw the physical reality as an emanation of the spiritual reality. And now the quintessence of the spiritual reality was gold. And this gold uh, represented the spiritual essence from which the material essence emanated. And that's why you will see throughout the continent the artifacts are golden because gold symbolized the essence of, of, of being. And now uh, what happened is that uh, the West, uh, which has a materialist worldview, did not understand the spiritual dimension of reality. And they thought that Africans are pagans and they described them as such and said Africans uh, were dark, the continent was dark, it was a, child of, a, a, a world of childhood. And how can children produce this type of artifacts, which Europe was not able to produce until after they had looted in Egypt, in Ethiopia, in Africa, and stolen the literature, which explained uh, the science which produces these things. And that science, unlike archaeology, was alchemy. Al is an Arabic word for the article the, chemi, is a corruption of the word kembe, kem, zambe, nyambe, which means the word of God. So in other words, Africans were using and knew about the word of God and uh, their first prophet, who is the first of all prophets, was also called kembe, kem. In Egypt, they called him kem, or Tau Tau Harama, the Greek said, is thought Hermes. So the whole science of alchemy came from Africa and it was a spiritual science. Now, what we call archaeology is an attempt by our generation to use objects, try to interpret history from the object. But the objects cannot tell you the whole story. They will tell you the material, about the material culture. For instance, uh, we talk about Mapunguye. People say it is the heel of the jackal because they don't know the spiritual aspect. But the word Mapunguye, you can break down into Ma, which is house, Pungu, which is divine wisdom, Bie, which is stone. So Mapunguye would be the stone house 
of the divine wisdom. And you take Zimbabwe. Uh, people say it is the houses of stone, but Zimba means lion. And that lion symbolizes the celestial lion, which is the sun. So Zimbabwe becomes the stone world house of the celestial lion, which is the sun. So in this uh, situation, you find that uh, the sun is central and the sun is symbolized by gold and the founders of uh, Mapungui and Great Zimbabwe call themselves the people of the sun. Vakara, Vakaranga, Vakalanga, Velanga, Vakalaga. But what do the politicians do? They go to Zimbabwe and say there are two main tribes. It is Mashona. Shona means West. Is the name that the Ndevelas gave to the Karangas. And then uh, they say Matevelelen. Matevelelen are people from South Africa who destroyed the Rosu Empire in, 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 in Zimbabwe. So even the identity of the people is, is wrong. And now if you go to Zimbabwe and say Karanga, they would be offended because they want to feel that they are Shona, which simply means West. It's like the Tswanas in Botswana. A Tswana means somebody from the East in Tswana Zazi. So it's no identity. I heard our uh, uh, Mbongi talking about South Africa saying Azania. The word Azania is a corruption of the word Zanj. Zanj means root or trunk is the origin. So the original Azania is Ethiopia, which was later called Abyssinia, and today is uh, modern e Ethiopia. But as Tambo said, South Africa was supposed to be Ma the Republic of Maluti or Malundi. Why? Because that Zimbabwe bed is Malundi. Ma means mother. Lundi means the needle that weaves together heaven and earth. And then that's why you have a Burundi, land of the needle. You have Lundi temple in Zimbabwe. You have Lundi river. You have uh, Mal Lundi in KZN. You have Malundi mountains in Lesotho. And you have the Undi river in Popo. It's Undi on the side of Botswana. So language, African language, uh, embodies the spirituality of the African people which can explain all these uh, artifacts which the archaeologists will not be able to explain. So in other words, the work of the archaeologists is very important because our culture was suppressed, but uh, the archaeologists must work with the spiritual, uh, spiritual uh, leaders. But lastly, I don't want to take your time. Uh, my sister here gave a brilliant input. She spoke about Chimurenga. And uh, who is Chimurenga? That Chimurenga is Murenga Soro Renzo, Renzo uh, the head of the elephant. In uh, uh, South Africa, we say Toyando, the head of the elephant. There were baby talk about Tohoto. Who is that? That is the first ancestor of the Karanga people. So when they say we wage a Chimurenga war, it means it's the war of the ancestors to fight back the impact of colonialism. So the Chimurenga one and two in Zimbabwe were not the last. There is going to be a third Chimurenga. That Chimurenga will be motivated by what my sister mentioned the failure to resolve the land question because spirituality and land go together. If you take away the land of the people, you are taking away their soul. So the people of South Africa have lost their soul because they lost their land. And that's why you can see what is going on in the country. It's disastrous uh, because people have lost their soul. They don't know where they are, whether they are coming or going. They are fighting amongst themselves, and uh, that all these things will cum cumulatively lead to the 
the third Chimurenga, which will be unfortunate because much of what we have will be destroyed and building afresh is going to be difficult. Zimbabwe is destroyed. Why? Because during the struggle, the spiritual leaders are the ones who guided the gorillas. But after freedom, they didn't go back to the shrines of Muariwedenga to thank the ancestors. Siko, I'm gonna come back. I'm gonna ask you to talk about the the, the images that you that you that you presented, because as you um, so skillfully um, presented it, it, it it's an idealization of how gold mining happened. And I'm going to come back to Professor Kikurai because one of the things that happens is that as archaeology develops, um, and also to do with the spiritual element, it's actually emerging that quite a lot of it was not as communal as people actually imagine it to be, but that there were actually spiritual groups or groups of people who essentially were the guardians of the gold and they lived around the gold and there was actually very little contact between them and the people who came to purchase the gold and they would bring the cattle. I mean, this is the kind of archaeological story that is emerging. That, I mean, in, um, in West Africa, they were called the Nyamakala because it's kind of like a, a sect of the community that actually almost lives as, 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 as a kind of permanent gatekeeping of the gold. And that also that the gold has nothing to do with power because people often assume that the gold belonged to the kings, which is what Europe was obsessed with. When Europe came to Africa, they thought we must find the king who owns the gold. And actually it is these um, almost secret groups that, that own the gold and the king himself or herself, if it was a queen, had to, had to uh, uh, pay a tribute to the, to the gold miners. It wasn't just a appropriation, it wasn't belonging, it wasn't ownership, it was, it was tribute. Um, so that complex story, I think, is missing from, from that Peter um, Gallic, Gallic images. And so how do you respond to, as I say, this kind of almost utopian vision and actually the much more complicated spiritual and also architectural um, issues that actually were involved in the construction of many of these city-states. That it's not just, um, it's not random, because I think in the picture, one of the things that comes out is almost like gold mining was kind of random, but it's not actually very uh, random. It was quite a, a, a systematic and, and also architecturally based um, uh, system of production. So how do you sort of keep interacting with, with, that, with that growing research? I think, um, like I said when I started this presentation, that Mapungube for me, to approach it, to just speak about Mapungube would have been just too blunt. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to expand and show that the settlements is much larger than just this one place and linked to various regions and places in the region. And I also wanted to show that there are different moments that we are talking about. So I showed at least two books, um, The New Aspects in, in Archaeology, which was produced at a moment where we were deep in a Chimurenga. And that book needed to do something very different to the next two books that I showed, which are these childlike drawings, which that moment in time required um, the people that were working with the images to distribute what the first archaeological text had found. And I think that we are in a different moment right now, and so um, different image might, images might be required. And, and, and I think for me, I'm not looking at those images as truth. I said these images are not at all truth. They're about making mm -hmm. African history Africa's too direct. And I think this is what is exciting for me about these images, that they say that all the images that I showed before were colonial images, like, you know, you have the topography, you have um, the slave um, admiring the Queen Sheba. These images are themselves not about truth, but they're about power. Mm. And I think the images I show are a counter-visuality. They counter power. They protest against the images that came before them. 
and what the images that we require today also need to live up to a different moment. You know, I'm calling on to, I do it myself, I, I also am a, a make images myself, and, and the question when making images for this time is, what is required for now? And, and for me, the, the garlic images that I showed were just to show that this was a particular moment and produced this book, this was a particular moment and produced these images. And the call now is to define the moment, but also contribute to the images that are required for this moment from these material remains. Uh, Professor Pikula, I come back to you. Um, yes. Because one of the things that has become interesting from an archaeological perspective is that for a long time, archaeology functioned almost at eye level, at, at sort of mm. Uh, man height or human height. And now what has happened is that when people take aerial photographs, they suddenly realize that there's a, actually a pattern, mm. a, a concentric circle pattern mm. in many of these settlements, where when you see them from above, they actually almost look like copies of each, of each other. And so it suggests that our ancestors were essentially using mathematics and using mathematics to order their lives because they were using a scientific principle of essentially building a circle into a circle, into a circle, into a circle, mm. um, or using different kinds of circular formations to build many of these, um, of these settlements. So for example, one of the pieces that we see here is that scepter, which is a spiral mm. um, or shape. And to make that uh, physically actually requires mathematics. Yeah. You don't just sort of mm, beat the, mm. the gold until it is, that, it is that shape. You are building a, 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 an architectural, architectural piece. Would you like to comment a little bit on that, on how it is that um, the, the initial understanding of archaeology was so, sort of like this, that this was a, um, it was a serendipitous, that there was actually no order in many of these uh, uh, societies, but actually that what is emerging now is that many of them were built on principles of order rather than principles of principles of chaos? In, indeed, you are quite right. Um, part of the problem of archaeology is the manner in which it takes an evolutionary approach to the origins of societies. Um, yes, evolution is an approach, it's a theory, it's a methodology, but at the same time, it, it tends to go with it or to take along with it the notion of um, the human progress. In other words, the more you get back into the past, the less progressive or the less complex you are. Uh, that perception is, is, is obviously wrong. The fact that you see the circles that you are referring to, you see the scepter um, in a circular, uh, there's the head which is circular and then there's the, the twisting and things like that. It, it, it shows that already before we even talk about a discipline called mathematics in Europe, there were people already using these principles long back. How far long back is something that um, is, is very difficult to establish because of the broad length um, geographical scope in which you find most of these things. You know, how does the human mind operate? Um, do we always live in rectangular structures? What makes it easier, let's say, to, to live in a rendezvous or a secular house? What principles guide such, you know, spatial formation or such partial configuration? Without complicating this discussion um, in a further, what I would want to resort to is the manner in which archaeologists have moved from um, just material focus to what is called the landscape focus. In other words, looking at patterns within a given geographical scale. Because this is the way society operated on. And at the very local scale, this is where they made these particular objects. And these particular objects were made to, you know, interact with the broader, you know, ecology, with the broader environment. 
So landscape archaeology has been a development of the last maybe 30, 40 years. And now it has taken a very complex dimension. Um, I, I can say uh, a colleague and I, for example, have, have also used what is called LIDAR to try and understand not what we see on the surface of Great Zimbabwe, but what lies in between, in, in, you know, in, in, what lies beneath. So we can now even speak about water and, and how that society functioned within the available you know, um, it, uh, hydrological context. Um, in the past, it was simply thought that, well, there are civilizations that grow because they were living close to water resources. They would cite Egypt, they would cite Mesopotamia, the Indus Valley, and, 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 and um, those civilizations in China. But, but what about Mapungubu? Can't you see that within a, a hydrological context? You can only do so if you look at the landscape. If you take such photographs and try to understand why the Shashi Limpopo is dry now, but what potentially lay beneath that particular basin that would make Mapungubwe and its complex sites attractable to that particular basin. So the answer really lies in the importance of landscape archaeology because we need to see the bigger picture. Okay. And to you, Dr. Uh, Matoli, you were talking about the origins of alchemy. So again, it's one of those things that uh, Europe spent many centuries writing. I mean, for those people who don't know, Europeans essentially didn't know that gold was a natural resource. They thought that Africans were magicians also who were sort of magically producing the gold, um, and which is why they became obsessed with um, what became alchemy, this idea of producing gold from base metals. So many Europeans burnt themselves and exploded their homes mm. trying to make gold um, um, in, 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 this, in this practice of alchemy. But what I want you to respond to is this relationship between science and the spirit and the question of life and how it is that these societies were not just about producing these grand uh, buildings, these grand uh, monuments, these grand artifacts, but this, this sustaining of life, the, the breath, the, the, the other aspect of, of, of the chemical composition of the human being, which is that you, you have to have oxygen, you have to have breath in order, in order to be alive. Um, and how that in itself, that sustaining of life was a, a spiritual enterprise. You know, the saddest thing today <clears throat> is that uh, we talk about state capture because we are talking about uh, material things that have been taken away from the people. But the original capture was the introduction of the Western materialist worldview and the Western secular religions. For instance, the Western will tell you that there was a big bang and that you know everything came out of that big bang but if you just look carefully at the african dresses you look at the images on their dresses you will see for instance this spiral and that spiral is actually actually symbolizes evolution which was not violent like a bang uh, something that unfolded itself. And when it unfolds, it manifests itself as a woman, which is the queen of heaven, symbolized by the queen, the, the bed of heaven, Shiria Denga, with that bed in Zimbabwe, which Cecil John wrote, sent Willie Posselt, his archaeologist, to steal it. And that bed is in Dane Hayes in Cape Town. And Mandela did not understand what it meant. So he moved out of the bedroom of Cecil John Rhodes because he feared that his children would destroy that bed. But he didn't know what that bed meant. meant. But Cecil John Rhodes would not undertake any work without praying to the bed. And now the Westerners make us pray 
to a white man and a white mother who were actually not white because uh, this was uh, the black Madonna and child which came out of Africa. It is Malundi and Lundi. So you can see how they captured our minds and then we lost this whole thing. Then they tell us that there is science. What we deal with is suspicion. What is science? They say A squared plus B squared is equal to C squared. Is the uh, theorem of Pythagoras. This theorem existed before Pythagoras was born. It is the formula which was used to build the pyramids. It actually says spirit squared plus soul squared is equal to the body squared. And the spirit is the mind, body, and soul is the trinity. And the soul is fire, water, earth, and air is four. And the body is spirit plus the four elements. So science comes out of African uh, spirit, uh, spirituality. And now, you, they say, the Bible says, uh, at the beginning there was chaos. What is chaos? We, if you look at the Zimbabwe bed, you see the bed, and then you see three eggs, Mavye Aziva, which symbolizes spirit, uh, soul, and body. And you see a chevron. That chevron symbolizes the waters of origin, uh, which is Nunu, and they say it's chaos. There was never chaos, and nothing happened through chaos. That's, all these things were orderly. And that chaos is also symbolized by a square within a square, which gives you eight points. And these eight points are symbolized by the eight beds of Zimbabwe. The first bed is the sun, and then the seven are the seven Pleiades stars, or circumpolar stars, which are known to all indigenous African people as uh, Chirimela, Chirimela, Kilimia in Swahili, and so on. So Africans have a complete understanding of the origins of reality, and science is part of uh, that evolution, and they explain these things uh, uh, scientifically. But now we were captured by the West, which only understand things by analyzing them. Uh, that's why the West focuses on analyzing material things. And they think if you understand the material things, you understand reality, although the virus is beating them because uh, they can't see beyond the virus, that uh, there's life beyond the visible things that are giving us uh, problems. Siko, I just thought that you should respond to a little bit of that, because in your own presentation, you leave out the, 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 the famous Zimbabwe bird, even though it's on the cover of, of the garlic book. Um, why, why did you make that choice? Why do you think that um, that aspect of it, which I think uh, Dr. Mutafa is pointing to, the, the sort of uh, visual power um, which many other societies have uh, attempted to capture, um, that the power of the eagle, the power of, of, of rivers meeting life, all of that, why did you leave it out as a visual, as a visual cue to what actually was at stake in, in in the Zimbabwe, in the Zimbabwe ruins, uh, instead of just the sort of image of mining. Um, okay, so um, I am interested in visuality and how visuality shapes modernity, and I wanted to anchor modernity in Southern Africa around gold, and link that. Of course, we know Johannesburg remains the biggest gold reserve ever found in the world. Mm but we have remnants of that in the 13th century, long before Johannesburg becomes what it is today. And I, I wanted to link that idea of gold and modernity and this space and what we have beneath us. Um, but of course, the paper I gave today is a section of a much longer study visualizing late Iron Age settlements. And in this longer study, I track Yes, European images, these topological images that you find. But I slowly move towards the visualization of what we require today. And I 
grapple with um, questions of spirituality and worldviews and cosmologies um, and how these cosmologies shape the world um, around them. And so this is something that I get to in the longer study, but of course I had a mandate, I had 30 minutes, and um, I just thought that focusing on gold and gold mining was appropriate for today because what, we, what sits in front of us and the city that moves Southern Africa today is centered, is anchored on gold. And, and this, this is why I, I chose gold and, as opposed to um, the, 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 the bird, which is something I look at and something I explore in my own visual images, but I just thought it was something not appropriate for today, not for my presentation anyway. Mm -hmm. And of course, um, I knew that spiritual matters would be handled um, by a representative on the, on the panel. Sorry. Mm -hmm. yes. You see the other lie that uh, Europeans tell us is that they discovered gold in 1886 in Johannesburg. But the empire of Mundrapa, you know, from uh, Zambia right up to uh, the Cape Colony, there was one empire. That was the empire of the people of the sun. But because the leaders of that empire were the Munomutapa dynasty, it is recorded as the empire of Munomutapa. That empire mined here in Johannesburg. And uh, because the founder of that empire was Tovela. They, Johannesburg was called Tovela. There was even a tree to, called Tovela, where these people rested when they were mining uh, gold. So the history that we are learning is such a distorted and adulterated history that Africans today are struggling to find out who they are but uh, if they were just to live alone these uh, histories uh, of the Europeans and even go to the spirit mediums, because uh, there's a book called uh, The Bones Shall Rise Again. It's written by a Zimbabwean. Uh, and this Zimbabwean was trying to trace the history of Chimurenga. And then he goes to the spirit mediums, the one leads to the other, because these spirit mediums are the priests of the Queen of Heaven, Muariwedenga, who was the goddess of uh, Mapungubi. And in that cosmology, there is no man who is the supreme being. The supreme being is a woman. The man that we call God, our creator, is the son of a woman. So if we were to follow that spirituality, we would, wouldn't be having problems of gender-based violence, femicide, and all these, uh, uh, all these uh, problems. Now the problem is that uh, the colonialists have created the African in the image of Europe, but uh, the Europeans are materialists, the Africans are spiritualists, and then there is a identity crisis and a spiritual crisis amongst African people. So uh, this initiative is very, very important if it can be used as you are suggesting to reimagine who we are. And I think uh, we need to find who we are truly. Otherwise, uh, we are doomed. Thank you for that, because I'm also getting the signal that we should wrap up. But um, on that point about the gender dynamics of many of these societies. I mean, in the Western world, the reversal of a female leader and a male um, uh, population was done by Ryder Haggard. Ryder Haggard actually wrote an entire novel called She, but what he then did in the novel was make the woman white. So like there's a white woman who is living in Africa, living eternally, living forever, but everyone around her is black. And the whole story is about her white descendants uh, coming to find her and essentially rescue her from, 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 from this entrapment in, in, in Africa. So in, even in colonial times, the idea of a, of a, of a, of a kind of matriarchal uh, cosmology was used, but it was used in order to place a white woman in, in the place of the, of, of the mother. So in, in closing, I'm gonna ask everybody to give their closing remarks 
also reconnecting with, I guess, the spiritual and, 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 and spectral um, uh, artifacts that are, that, are, that are in front of us. So I'm going to start with you, uh, Siko, come to you, Dr. Motsefa, and then end with you, um, Professor Pikara. I think um, I would like to end off with where my study ends off, my larger study, which is um, the post-colonial moment or the decolonial moment is about much more than looking at the colonial moment itself. It's about looking at the deep past and archaeology, spirituality, um, these objects that we have in front of us, they're, they're catalysts at looking at that deep past. And um, that's all I have to say today, that, that it's important to look at long, the long Southern African past, the deep Southern African past, the archaeological past, the spiritual past. I have just produced a booklet called Karaism, Its History and Impact on Western uh, Civilization. Because I believe that uh, the call for the decolonization of the African mind is at the same time the formula that we need to liberate Europeans from their superiority complex, from their male god, uh, and, and therefore this booklet will assist, and I want to donate it to the center so that the students who want the colonization of the mind can read out of this. And I have um, another book, Decolonizing the African Through Indigenous Knowledge System which shows you that, uh, for instance, there were, is nobody who ever existed called Adam, and that uh, Africans are not the descendants of Adam. Because if that is true, it would mean that at some point we were white, and Africans were never white. They were always black because Africa is hot, and this blackness protects us against the sun. So the history that we have has been uh, falsified, to justify white uh, supremacy and unless we work to decolonize our minds and decolonize the minds of Europeans, there will never be peace in the world. Today is a reconciliation day. People are saying, but reconciling what with what and with whom are we reconciling? Because Europeans are still captured by a false theory that they are superior they are made in the image of God. Africans are made in the image of Satan. So we have a duty, a chimurenga, uh, to liberate white people from their false theories which are creating problems of racism and patriarchy. Uh, Professor Pikara. Thank you very much, um, facilitator. Um, what, what, what I see from this dialogue um, is that to be able to engage with, let's say, Mapungubwe, um, it's, not, it's not just the, the, the material objects that we see. It's, it's, it's not just you know, the gold, but it's also the broader context. And, and this is where Siko made a very powerful presentation that, look, if, even if you look at Great Zimbabwe, there is a broader context that engages with even Mapungubwe. Yes, spiritual matters do apply because there is what is called the tangible and the intangible and meta spiritual can actually go through the tangible right hence some of these objects that we see around us but what i want to question is that um, we need to see southern africa in the in its very own context otherwise we run the risk of being colonized by other African contexts, for example, um, looking at Southern Africa within the context of Egypt and, 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 and Nubia, right? Because I know for sure from the research that I've done, at some stage we were a center of globalization, right? Um, because globalization shifts, you know, um, either in centuries or decades, and we were a center, right? But to conclude, this is the day of reconciliation. What does it mean when we're looking at when we are looking at what Sikh was presenting to us, right? Given the checkered history of the discovery of this collection, for example, the archaeology around Mapungubwe, 
the history around archaeological research around Mapungubwe, the context in which the University of Pretoria finds itself, as well as other institutions, I can mention this, I can mention Cape Town, they are part of the collective. It means engaging in very difficult conversations in terms of what archaeology needs to do and what archaeology needs to achieve. For me, archaeology must not just engage with the archaeologist, but with the broader public, because they provide a richer context in which meaning can be found. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think I'm, we have time for questions. If members of the audience would like, is there a roving mic? There's a roving mic. Uh, please ask questions and please make them questions um, and uh, make them brief so that we can give as many people the opportunity to ask. You can ask any of the panelists or you can ask the whole panel um, a question. Any takers? Oh, there's a right here behind me. Um, good afternoon. Um, ladies and gentlemen, panelists, thank you so much for the, and also the organizers, thank you so much for such a riveting conversation around originality and meaning and being. The, my question is, uh, anyone on the floor, um, well, starting off with Dr. Mosheka, how can we reconcile, how can we reconcile African spirituality in modern education? Uh, in, in, in modern education, when I look, what I mean by that is in, in centers of, high, of higher education, like your universities, how do we reconcile that aspect of, of identity or spirituality in order for us to decolonize the, the, the key aspect of who we are and what we are so that we are able to liberate um, Southern Africa? Yeah. you want oh, to yeah. respond? Yeah. <laughs> you see, our problem in these institutions is that we are taught that all that is called philosophy comes from the Greeks. All that is called religion comes from the Jewish, which is all false. <clears throat> because uh, the main Greek philosophers came to Egypt to study. And what we call Egypt was a, a colony of ancient Ethiopia. Ancient Ethiopia is a country south of Egypt, which is today Bil al Sudan, which means the land of the black people. And now it is black people who created Egypt. But Egypt has now been captured by the Libyans, by the Hyksos, uh, by the Greeks, by the Persians, by the Arabs. So what you see as Egypt today is no longer Egypt. And the Western scholars even claim that the Egyptians were white people from Atlantis, which is a lie. Now, if you go to religion, the Jewish people learned about religion in Egypt. And the Egyptians learned about uh, religion from the Ethiopians. For instance, they give you the picture of Jesus. He's a white man. But the real picture of uh, Christ is the Sphinx. Because that Sphinx is what the Bible says there is a God who came in the flesh, or the Son of God who incarnated on earth. It is the Sphinx. But these people say the Sphinx is pagan. In short, what I'm trying to say is that uh, we must go back to the philosophers of ancient Egypt and that will take us to Ethiopia, which is black Africa, and you will find that uh, actually the custodians of uh, the original philosophy today, you will find them here in southern Africa, which is called Sabia. But those who corrupt our history say there's Queen Sheba, wife of Solomon. Sabia comes from Saba. Saba is, the, is a, the queen of heaven. It's another name of the queen of heaven. Uh, the philosophy that we should be pursuing, both black and white, 
is that uh, every human being is made of spirit and matter. And at the spiritual level, there's no black man, there's no white man. So because we focus on what we can see, we are obsessed with the idea of black people, white people. I even wonder, our people will say, we are black South Africans. I'm not a black South African. I'm an African in this country that is called South Africa, which should actually be Maluti, the Republic of Maluti, not Azania, because Azania is up north. It's not, it, 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 it's not here. So we must change the curriculum at the universities if we want to fight racism, because there's no black man or uh, white man. Uh, we are all human beings of different shades of color, and therefore there are also no colored people, because uh, the essence of a, what we call a colored is a spirit. And why should we have somebody called a, a colored person? What is, because the spirit is not colored. Like your spirit is not colored. The spirit of the white man is not colored. We are all the same, but we look different because of the intensity of the sun. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Professor Pikurai um, to comment on the curricular changes, but I also want to add a little note about actually there is at least one text in which uh, a, a, a non-practicing Jew actually admits that Moses was an Egyptian, and that's uh, Freud. So Freud wrote, wrote yes. a book which very few people actually reference called Moses and Monotheism. And the book is essentially about showing that Moses, that the founder of the Hebrew religion is an Egyptian. And every chapter is about Moses was an Egyptian, actually. And, so Jesus, and Jesus was. Yes. Actually, uh, Jesus was not Christ. Yeah. Jesus was Yeshu ben Mary Amun in Greek. Yeshu ben Mary Amun becomes Jesus ben Mariam. Yeah. And the surname Mariam you only find in Africa and nowhere else. It's like the word Amen. Uh, the Muslims say Amin, and then the Westerners say Amen. That word can only be found in Africa. So it only shows that these religions come from here. They have been adulterated and brought back to us as a white religion. So, uh, okay, Siko, you want to respond as well. Um, the whole question of how do you change the curriculum in, in, uh, in a formal setting like a school or a university yeah. in order for it to speak to, to, to uh, these spiritual and archaeological and I dare say the, the, the sort of city-states of, of yeah. the African continent? Right. Um, you do not have to change the curriculum because the students have told you to do so. You have to change the curriculum because it has to be something relevant to a context in which you are presenting it. There's no point for someone, and I've always been telling people about this, for someone to come from Harvard or Oxford or Cambridge to study or to see the very same books that they have in their own university presses there. It means that it starts with us in terms of producing the knowledge that can also benefit the West in, in the way we see things, in the way we do things, and in the way we teach things. So if I can speak for archaeology, what I'm trying to say here is Given the more than one and a half centuries of the development of archaeology as a discipline, where we have learned a European discipline coming into Africa, and some of us embracing it and now teaching it at universities, my role as an archaeologist now is that what is that I need to learn, or really to unlearn, because you know, unlearning is a process of undoing all the knowledges that I have received and which I have erroneously transferred to other minds. Now, given the fact that, you know, we are all talking about decolonization and our universities are asking us to decolonize this, decolonize that, 
it does not have to be a rushed job. We need to seriously reflect in terms of what needs to happen, what kind of knowledge we need to produce, or what kind of knowledge we are currently producing, and then see that in the classroom context. Otherwise, someone comes from another continent and they see, still see the very same thing that they are learning in their eyes. You can't call that globalization. It's simply replication. Mm -hmm. right? You come to Africa to learn exactly what Africa does present to the rest of the world. That's globalization. Mm -hmm. Fiko? I just wanted to say that I think a lot of times when people ask questions like this, the assumption is that people are not doing work that is radical and that work is not accessible. Um, and I think the latter might be true, but the first statement is not necessarily. I think there are many people within academia that are doing radical work. Um, I've read um, some of Professor Pickerai's work, for instance, and I think this is as radical, if, if people could just have access to this, if more. So I like Jacob Lamini, who wrote Native Nostalgia, when he says we need to um, uplift our level of conversation and I think sometimes it's not as radical as going to write everything, but it's just understanding what is already there. And I think for me, when I, and, what, and this is again why I like these two books, you have the academic text, and 10 years later, you have it accessible to the public. Great Zimbabwe was said to be a non-African state, and it took 100 years to undo that thinking. And I think really, really sometimes some questions that people are desperate to find have already been answered, but we spend 100 years asking the same question. And this is why I'm really interested in visuals, because visuals are so ex allegedly accessible to people and how they shift and change and travel so quickly. Um, I think a lot of times it's really just about making knowledge that is there accessible and, and not necessarily finding something new. And people are doing that. People are doing hard work. People, are doing, people around this table are doing hard work, but how many people have access to that knowledge which is cutting edge and really radical? And I think that's where the, the, the disparities between these two books is really what I'm interested in, the academic text and then having people understand that academic text. Do we have time for one more question? Is there a member of the audience who has a, a burning question? There's a question right there behind the... Someone behind Oh, okay. Asa, I also got a question. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Sanele. Um, my, my name is Sanele, and I'd like to find out what was the relationship between uh, the agricultural practices that the civilization was doing then and what we're doing now? I don't know if it's a clear question. The relationship between the cultural practices of? Agriculture. Practices of these civilizations. The countercultural. Agri the agricultural. Oh, agricultural practices, okay. Uh, in yeah. fact, I think that's, uh, Professor, because we didn't really talk about it, the, mm -hmm. the history of, um, I, because one of the things that I think is fascinating often by, uh, about these civilizations is why did they come to an end? And people often then work backwards, exactly, and then it often ends up being this question of sustainability. You know, these civilizations yes. ended because there was a drought or the river dried up or... Um, they could no longer sustain the livelihood that, that, um, that, that had sustained the civilization. So they could no longer su sustain cattle, they could yeah. no longer sustain agriculture, etc., etc. Mm. But I think that you are the better expert to respond to that fully. Um, and I think, uh, Professor Dr. Matsaka, if you want to also yeah. add to, to that, as I say, it's almost like from a Western perspective, you work backwards. You start with the, with the collapse, mm. and then you try and find the origins of the collapse. Yeah, perhaps I can spin it slightly differently and say, how did these societies come to an end? Why? Um, one point that you should always remember when I'm talking about, let's say, Great Zimbabwe and Mapungubwe, which are part and parcel of ancient state systems or complex societies, is that 
there are always states or complex societies are always in experiment by someone. Let's say a ruling clique, a ruling elite, a king, someone more powerful. They are not designed to last forever, right? So that may explain to you that, uh, you know, just like an experiment, it is a beginning and a conclusion, right? You know what the answer is going to be. Right? But then there are other sustainable, sustainability issues, like you can build a political entity and vagaries, let's say, of the environment come in and your agricultural base or your other, your economic base, be it cattle, be it something else, comes to an end or is threatened by something else. Drought, um, long-term aridity, and things like that. Complex societies are impacted on by that. And the reason why we are starting to engaging with these ideas more and more, and I can tell you that in the last five to 10 years, we, we, we are now talking about the demise, the collapse, the end of complex societies because of what we see happening around us in terms of climate change, because we see an end to, a possible end to our own human condition, um, which is threatened by so many things that we think we may not have control of. Um, some people say, okay, the solution lies in controlling global warming. It's just, it's just you know, a, a suggestion. But um, I, I cannot come up with an answer right now, but for Great Zimbabwe and Mapungubwe, people think that uh, a mega, you know, a major threat to these entities was the declining, you know, um, either social political conditions when it comes to, let's say, the Mtapa state, but for Mapungubuke, it was the environment. Because what you see now in the middle in Popo Valley is not what was there some 700 years ago. The environments there and then have changed. But we are not quick to say states do come to an end because there's a change of environment. Uh, we have to be very cautious in terms of how we end up explaining either the end, the demise, or the collapse of complex societies. But whatever happens, whether they come to an end, or whether they collapse, or whatever, their economic base, their sustenance, their sustainability is challenged. That's what we can say. Um, so I was actually going to ask you to elaborate a little bit, because one of the things that's interesting about the study of, of archaeology is actually that archaeologists often look at what is often called the middens where people disposed of their waste and you try and also excavate yeah. from that mm. what people ate you know what kinds of bones do you find there mm. do you find uh, sheep do you find cattle do you find goats do you find small mm. children do you find pottery do you find yeah. do you want to elaborate a little bit on how you actually use waste to to un try and unpack what a society uh, physically depended on yes um being conscious of the audience, one of the things I tried as much as possible to avoid was being technical. Um, because the most important thing when you're con you know, conversing archaeology or any other discipline is to make sure that the other person who is not a practitioner <coughs> understands. What she's talking about is that you know, when you are doing your daily activities around the household, um, you light a fire, you cook, you eat, and then the, there are certain things that you dispose of, like the ashes, like the, you know, the, the remains of what um, you, know, you couldn't complete in terms of eating a meal. And they eventually get um, heaped up there in, on a heap. That's what she, she's referring to as a maiden. Archaeology does look at those contexts as well, if you find them, if they are well preserved. And you can actually build um, or reconstruct 
the history of people based on what you find in those particular areas. But beyond the meetings, you can also look at what happens within settlements and what happens without the settlements. In other words, both inside and outside the settlements and try to see how people were also living. It's not, it's not only what they were eating and what they were disposing of, but how they were doing certain things beyond those, those, those things. That gives you the totality of the evidence that um, we try to reconstruct for people to understand. Right. That's Dr. Mutsaka, you wanted to respond yes, to Yes, this. I wanted to say that, uh, you see, the problem of uh, Western education is based on theories of individuals and speculation and guesswork. Because uh, if you take Mapungu and Great Zimbabwe, those civilizations were anchored on the rain goddess who is the queen of heaven. And that rain goddess had certain solar and lunar festivals which had to be observed to maintain harmony between the spiritual world and the material world. And the failure to maintain that harmony leads to these problems of uh, 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 climate change and droughts and all these things. Uh, for instance, the two equinoxes and the two, uh, <clears throat> what do you call, equinoxes and solstices, they mark four stations of the sun. There are certain rituals which must be conducted during those. But the Western religion has changed the, uh, the spring equinox. They make it a religious festival which has no meaning. They take Christmas uh, and they make it the birth of Jesus. But Jesus was not born on the 25th, 25th of December. It's just a fabrication by the West. And they take uh, the autumn equinox. They say it's the death and resurrection of Jesus, which is not true because Jesus never died on that date. And that's why Easter happens on different days. Now, today, we are looking forward to New Year. This new year is on the 1st of January. What's new on the 1st of January? Africans watched the seven stars, Pleiades stars, in the middle of September. When they appear, it means the rain goddess in heaven says it's time to plow. Go and cleanse the plowing fields. The rains will come. Don't plow, plow after the first rains. Plow after the second. In October, you must have rainmaking ceremonies. In November, don't cut trees, don't kill female animals, respect pregnant women, and then in December, you must celebrate first fruit festivals. And all those things were related to the agriculture of the, of the, of, of the past. Now, neglect of all this leads to the collapse of these uh, social systems which in themselves were sustainable. Now we are basing our life on guesswork by Western theoreticians who differ among themselves and their theories change from time to time. So before I ask Aza the question, I think if we have time, we can come back also to this question of monocultures, where what the Western world has introduced is also this a cultivation of single crops where an entire community of people or civilization will depend on the production of maize, whereas in fact in what the evidence from um, many of these sites shows is that people are cultivating 10 different types of grains in order to sustain life. If one crop fails, you have the second crop, you have the third crop. But the monoculture, that's the uh, form of agriculture that was introduced by uh, Western uh, thinkers has made all of us depend on one crop and if that crop fails then there's starvation and hunger whereas I think many of these actually depended on a rotation of, of different of different crops but I'm gonna take a, a question okay oh my gosh <laughs> Okay, so Azza, do you mind asking your question in person to each of the different of, of the different people? 
Um, do we have time for people to give their final comments, or do we? Yes. Okay, so uh, yeah, yes. this. Can hmm? I just say, for instance, uh, the African Union said that uh, this year is the year for uh, arts, culture, and heritage as levers for building the Africa we want. Because African leadership have discovered that all these models that we import from Europe are not helping us, and actually they are leading to our destruction. So uh, one thing that we must do is to go and revive the African calendar, which is based on African cosmology, which will realign us and our lives with the spiritual world, which is something that is missing today. So I'll take that as your closing comment. Yeah, yes. Uh, Siko, I'll give you the, op the next opportunity and then hmm. Professor Pico. My, I'll again go back to images. Images travel, they slip out of our hands um, from one book into the next book. And I think artists should um, participate in the creation of the long past. And mm. um, it's not just the responsibility of archaeology. Both arts, uh, or visual people, visual cultures, um, people that sing, spiritual leaders, all these people should work together to create um, the distant or the long Southern African past. Mm. Professor Pekura? As I said earlier on, um, this is Reconciliation Day. It's, it's, it's about engaging in very difficult conversations. And, and I think we have succeeded in, you know, at least we have made a start. And, and Jaffet UP must be congratulated for, 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 for bringing us together to, to start the, the dialogue. Just, just one footnote in, in terms of your, 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 your burning question on the monoculture. Um, I think the best example is illustrated by the introduction of maize you know, from across the Atlantic. Once it came into this African continent, the, the destructive effects on local cultures was immense. Yes, we do love our pub, but the consequences are very clear. We are more dependent on the West than anything else because maize is a vulnerable crop. Thank you. Thank you so much. It, it gives me such great pleasure to be the person who closes the session and to thank everyone uh, for your contributions and uh, to thank the spirits of Mapungube, the ancestors who are sitting in front of us for also allowing us um, to, because in, in Africa, they, the ancestors can also refuse your, your participation. So today we have been, we have been allowed that, that honor of sitting around these artifacts and having a conversation. And thank you so much to the Javit um, Art Center for bringing us all together. And I, th I hope the conversation will continue after the, the recorded session. Um, thank you to the technical teams. Um, so all of us are sitting in the dark, but there are all these people behind us who are making this all possible for, for the rest of the audience that are sitting at home or sitting via the internet and listening to us. So thank you, technical teams. Um, so thank you, everybody. And this brings us to the end of, of, of this session. Thank you. 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 Thank you.